Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. It's astonishing how wide the gap is between the public health position on vaping in England and that of the United States and Canada. One side values evidence, and the other, emotion and, <laughs> emotion and hysteria. In England, a cabal of careful researchers conducting impeccable scientific research on the impact of vaping as a tool for harm reduction has stood by vaping during what could have been its darkest hour the U.S. lung illness scandal. Just last week, Public Health England, or PHE, released the sixth report in its series of independent reports commissioned by PHE to summarize evidence on e-cigarettes to inform policies and regulations. The report meticulously addresses each of the issues anti-vaping activists expound as dangers of vaping and simply refutes each one with, again, impeccable science. Joining us today to talk about the evidence in an exclusive interview with RegWatch is Linda Bald, Professor of Public Health at the University of Edinburgh and co-author of PHE's 2020 Evidence Update. Linda, thanks for coming back on the show. Nice to be here, Brent. Thanks for having me. So I'd like you to first catch our audience up with the track record of the cabal, you know, PHE, RCP, uh, with the full kind of track record so everyone can understand the body of work you guys have been doing over there. So we have a long history of nicotine and tobacco research in the UK going right back to the 1950s with the first studies on lung cancer and smoking. And when vaping uh, products began to emerge on the market around 2010, 2011, um, gradually our state bodies and our research funders got interested. So we began to see a lot of research funding being available. And uh, we've worked as a team across a number of universities for uh, quite a few years now. And so PHG, the statutory agency for public health in England, uh, decided to commission uh, my colleague Anne McNeil, a professor at King's College London, myself and others, uh, to continually review the evidence on vaping um, with a view to informing our policy context. And of course, there are other authoritative bodies like the Royal College of Physicians um, that have also produced evidence reviews. So PhD started uh, reviewing the evidence around 2013, 2014. Um, and of course, that had important findings like the fact that e-cigarettes were significantly less harmful than smoking by orders of magnitude. And then, of course, uh, we also looked at uh, marketing, for example, health impacts, smoking cessation. Um, and then in 2016, the Royal College of Physicians report, which was a huge amount of work, uh, substantial evidence reviews, again confirmed that vaping from all the evidence is significantly less harmful than smoking, can help smokers quit, and that rates of use by youth in the UK were low. Um, and since 2016, we've produced several more reports uh, for PHE. And when the legislation in the UK is re uh, reviewed, which it has to be reviewed by law in 2021, uh, we are about to start the process of doing an even larger, uh, more substantial review for PHE that will come out uh, probably in about 18 months' time. And this next review, it's really all about safety, is it not? Absolutely. So you, everybody will know that the uh, UK has left Europe <laughs> and uh, the regulatory framework we have here, a lot of it comes from Europe. And so there's an opportunity to review that. And so we want to make sure that we have the best evidence, the clearest information to give our policymakers so they can make the best decisions. And just to add, um, you know, we don't all agree on everything in the UK, uh, but we do have a large number of researchers and also a large number of funders like Cancer Research UK that have really uh, uh, put money into this topic because for us uh, reducing smoking rates remains a priority and we want to look at any option uh, that's going to support that. Right and I mean that truly is the case. I mean we talk about it all the time. We just had Dr. Brad Rodu on the show and Dr. Crystal Lawn talking about the funding and how there's you know can be biased certainly when a government and an agency like in the U.S. and Canada they come out and they say our goal is to be smoke free at a certain point and if you categorize vaping as smoking well, then that means vaping has got to be gone too. And so all the research tends to, as they say, all ships must sail in the same direction. And if that direction is all smoke free, then the research is going to necessarily potentially be biased. And we see a lot of that on this side of the pond. Yet on your side of the pond, it's completely different. And part of that is the funding then, I take it. Yeah, part of it is the funding. I mean, the U.S. has a lot of money for vaping research as well, but I think there's a couple of differences. We have a totally different approach to nicotine. We're not really concerned about addiction to nicotine, for example, in the same way. Um, 
and our, our very clear priority for us is to support adult smokers to quit because when you model smoke-free end games, whether it doesn't matter which country it is, unless we get more adult smokers to move away from tobacco now, those uh, goals will never be reached. Uh, that's the same for Canada, the US and the UK. And the other thing I think is that um, there are some regulatory hurdles. So the US hasn't been able to do large randomized control trials of vaping for smoking cessation because the researchers are not able to do that unless vaping is licensed as a medicine that can be used in trials. Um, so that, that's that been changing, but we've been able to do different types of research than the US. And often, if you ask a particular question, uh, it determines what kind of answer you're going to get at the end. So we've been able to look at other themes that perhaps haven't been covered in all countries. Right. Let's uh, let's jump over here to the computer for a second, because I'd like you to see uh, this from the Surgeon General. This was out January 23rd, so just a month and a half ago, and not enough evidence that e-cigarettes help to stop smoking, Surgeon General says, right? And, you know, this is a long line of what we've been hearing, certainly since the lung illness broke, but it's been forever. But really, actually, in the last eight months, it's been very heavy saying, well, you know, the evidence is not in, the evidence is not in, the evidence is not in. That's what we were hearing six years ago, and the evidence you guys were already bringing it in. Where are we at? Like, how can the Surgeon General of the United States come out and say well, there's no evidence? Well, I mean, I fundamentally disagree with that. Um, you know, we, we've we looked at all the evidence and from the UK, but also from other countries. So as I said, we've done these large randomized control trials. You'd be familiar with the one that Peter Hayek led, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, you know, mo the most prestigious medical journal potentially in the world that showed very clearly that vaping was helping people stop smoking um, compared to nicotine replacement therapy, for example, with counselling in both arms. Our population level studies in the UK show very clearly um, that our smoking rates are, are going down very encouragingly, but they've been helped, they've been assisted by the introduction of vaping and the fact that over a third of smokers choose to use these products and quit attempts. Um, and some of the studies that are shown that they don't make any difference um, in the US, there's so many different confounders. So I get very frustrated. The two things I think we have very clear evidence about is that nicotine, licensed nicotine, uh, regulated nicotine containing e-cigarettes are significantly less harmful than smoking, A, and B, that they're helping people quit smoking. And I think it's not scientifically accurate to say that those two statements are not correct. So Linda, you're the first that we've had uh, on from the researchers that kind of the core group there out of, in England since the vaping lung illness start. Leon Schaub came on uh, in October uh, our interview with Martin Dockrell from PHE was actually in the can in July, just weeks before uh, the, you know, the whole shit hit the fan, for the lack of a better term, in, in August. We wanted to give uh, our friends over there a bit of a break. We weren't banging on your guys' door looking for an interview uh, during September, October, November, December, even in January. Because you know what, we wanted to give you guys a chance to kind of get your legs and the science done, right? Like to, you know, to get where you're going to be on it. And so with PHE's release on, this, on the 2020 evidence update, you know, now is the time to get you on. How did the lung illness scandal affect the group, the research, and, and what is in this 2020 evidence update? So two things. The first thing is we tried to communicate very clearly in that update what the evidence says about Ivali and what has happened in the US, and I'll come on to that. Uh, the second issue, which I think you're asking two questions there, is how has it affected our ability to do our work and the perceptions and beliefs of uh, smokers and vapors in the UK? So those are two different things. On the first one, um, when these cases started to emerge, we were all very concerned. And, you know, these are tragic cases, often young people with serious respiratory illness and people have died as a result. Um, but what was weird is that we weren't seeing the same thing at all. And there seemed to be a geographic patterning of it, you know, in the U.S., across a whole range of states, eventually all states. So it's I mean, I'm a professor of public health and public health. And of course, we've now got a with coronavirus, a, a great example of this. You try and track and trace what the source is. And so in our report, what we've tried to do is make very clear what the evidence is from the U.S., which the CDC was very slow 
um, I think, to communicate to the public, which is very clear that these are contaminated products. They were uh, cannabis vaping, THC, uh, cut with vitamin E um, acetate. So, you know, that is that is very clear now. And not all the cases can be linked to that, but you know the reasons, Brent. Uh, often these are young people and they are not willing to disclose that they've been using products which are illegal in many states. Um, so that's the first thing. And our priority and, and Public Health England's priority was to reassure smokers in the UK that, it, that switching to vaping was still a great option for them uh, to move away from tobacco. And more importantly, or equally importantly, for people who were currently vaping, not to return to smoking. And unfortunately, my opinion is that in the US, those messages took months and months to emerge. Um, and I'm sure they've discredited uh, not only public health, but people's people's health. Do you want me to ask, answer your second question, which is how has it affected us? Um, yeah, well, do, let's just hang for, for a second there, because sure. when you're talking about in terms of the perception of harm, I've got some slides for that and, and that, uh, certainly set up. Let's just hang tight for a second here on this. Let me ask you as basically as direct as I can, and it's a question we've asked other researchers too as well. Do you believe that CDC's foot dragging on coming clean may have actually cost people lives? I think it definitely has, it definitely caused harm. So I think it caused harm in terms of, um, people not knowing what the source was and therefore um, those cases not being investigated and maybe potentially even people not getting the treatment that they needed. So that's the first thing. So I think, I, I mean, I'm sympathetic to my colleagues. I know how these things occur, but they definitely were not clear in their communication. And then secondly, I'm very, I am confident that the legislation that was introduced in a number of US states on the back of the Avali outbreak, which effectively removed the products from the shelves, from some outlets, uh, restricted the flavors, et cetera, that that will have caused some people to go back to smoking or caused others not to try vaping who are smoking. And that's a tragedy. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know what's, you know, just when you're talking about that, it brings up for me a whole a host of things because literally when we first started on this file, it was you and uh, John Britton and Dr. Farsalinos uh, and a few others, Clyde Bates, uh, early on that really kind of, well, they you guys drove the bus for our coverage in terms of, wow, totally credible, made sense, the science is there, uh, the nicotine uh, without smoke report, I mean, you were speaking to regulators. You weren't just talking to England. You were, you were the RCP report, which you also co-authored on too as well. And, um, you know, that in the gr grand history of RCP uh, being the first to call out uh, the, you know, evils of tobacco smoke back in 1956. And then again, throughout the ages, you know, really being hammering at home. You were speaking to regulators and you were saying, look, the, this is, this is less harmful, it's shown safe, and, um, and you should consider uh, regulations that promote uh, the use of vaping products as opposed to things that discourage it. So that's four years now where we're at. Can you see any headway or, or has this vaping lung illness completely wiped out gains that were made? I think we've definitely gone backward and things are more difficult now. I mean, we're managing to stay the course in the UK as are other countries like New Zealand who are have adopted a pro-harm reduction approach, but it's increasingly difficult. So we're getting asked questions here about flavors. Should we restrict flavors? Our research shows very clearly they're important for some vapors for smoking cessation. So I don't think we've progressed. And unfortunately, intergovernmental agencies uh, like the World Health Organization and others um, have are becoming increasingly negative. So I think not only the lung illness outbreak has damaged the whole narrative around harm reduction, but also the concerns about the rise, the rising figures in youth vaping in the US and also in Canada have, have made everything go backwards. So the balance that I see now in North America and the meetings I attend there and engaging with my colleagues is that all the focus is on youth and that adult smokers have effectively been forgotten or they're not as important and therefore the decisions are not around supporting people to stop smoking anymore. In the early days, I think we had a bit more airtime there, which right. is awful. It's awful, yeah, fair enough. And sorry to stomp all over your awful. Can just say that again, it's awful. 
It's awful. I mean, it's awful because it's the leading preventable cause of death, you know, uh, and smoking attributable illnesses like lung cancer um, are, are difficult to treat. They're commonly late diagnosed. Um, you know, it's, it's something that's preventable. And to deny people or confuse the public about any technology that's going to help us move away from that is, I mean, we need to protect young people, but not at the expense um, of adult smokers. Now, do you think that was purposeful? Because it certainly feels like somebody who's been covering this now for, for four and a half years, it certainly feels that CDC may have been searching for a pretext on which to slam vaping with, with something like this, because it certainly appears that they've killed the virtues of vaping and there is no virtue anymore. It's, it's, it's moved into the as harmful or even more harmful than smoking <laughs> category. And it just seems too convenient. Yeah, I mean, I can't speculate about the motives of a whole organization, but what I would say is it's very clear to me that there are some colleagues, including researchers, who from the very early days were absolutely opposed to this technology. They were suspicious because tobacco industry was involved. Um, they were negative around nicotine and they always had been. Um, and then for some members of the establishment, um, because these weren't medicines, and people were choosing to use them themselves, that was, you know, not the way it should be. So there's definitely uh, preconceptions and the lung illness outbreak was, you know, absolutely uh, another reason um, to stomp to stomp on this technology. Um, and that, that has been the case, not just in the US, but I, I see that in other countries as well, including in Europe in some places. Yeah, it has definitely, it's not just been North America where though this is the epicenter of it. No, I mean, uh, so and without naming specific organizations in Europe, we've got real concern in the Netherlands, for example, um, you know, from from key organizations. We have some countries like Finland that have banned uh, all, almost all the flavors from vaping uh, devices. Um, and then, of course, I do increasing amount of work in low and middle income countries where, you know, what's happened in India, the Philippines, etc. So the international climate is incredibly challenging. So we're going to uh, play just a, a quick clip here of um, a pullout from your appearance here on RegWatch back in, I believe this was 2016, actually, and it was in July 2016. You, you And then you came back on again in 2017 uh, in the fall with your gateway uh, study, with the big study that you, you had done there. So this is that very first time you gave me a ring and said, hey, I'm going to be come through your area. So we caught you in studios, which was fantastic. Yeah. So a short little bite. The reason why I want to do this is because I want to use, I want us to be juxtaposing how things sounded four years ago to keep us driving through here in this malaise of, of today. So here, uh, here's a quick bite. Linda, thanks for coming on the show. First off, tell us, how has the RCP's position towards nicotine changed since 1962? I think it's gradually changed. The RCP's priority was always to reduce the harm from smoking, and it started to look at nicotine in around 2005 and published its first report on harm reduction in 2007. And then since then, of course, e-cigarettes have been on the market. They've looked carefully at the evidence, and they've certainly concluded now that e-cigarettes are far safer than smoking. And that's what I wanted to uh, talk about there is this issue of it being far safer than smoking. Back then, that was okay. Like we were still talking about it's far safer than smoking. Now it's just Im almost impossible to get those words out. Yeah, it's, it's, tra it's, tra it's tragic because, of course, in contrast, Brent, what has happened is that the evidence has grown on that. You know, we know much more about the constituents. Uh, we're able to assess the difference between vaping and smoking in the studies that are done. And that doesn't change the overall finding that they're significantly less harmful than smoking. Um, and the science, you know, the science has been strengthened rather than weakened. And setting aside the Avali cases in the US, which are caused by something else. So, um, yeah, as I say, I, I don't think we, we're progressing, but I'm still hopeful. So uh, we've been frustrated a little bit here because we're so far down the road and, and the researchers that do uh, know or have a position or the science behind the statement that, you know, vaping is less harmful than smoking or so forth. You know, when do we start getting to the safe? <laughs> you know, it's safe. And, I, and so that's why I'm excited about the fact that PhD and the rest of you guys are doing this big study that's going to come out in 18 months that's focusing on safe. I'm also extremely excited that 
avenues were open for you because of Brexit. That's awesome because that's exactly what something like that is supposed to do is, you know, unshackle you from Europe's uh, draconian regulations. But um, that's politics. So let me just keep us back here on, on vaping lung illness again for a second. It's all about you guys. So President Trump comes out on 9-11 and announces a national flavor ban. And just like pop, <laughs> just pop. It just goes off. And I wanted to show this to everybody because um, PHZ literally on the 12th, within hours, uh, out through uh, Associated Press, and oh, let me see, they're not going to let me show because I hate the ads. Let's see here. There we go. So within hours, uh, banning flavored vaping products in the UK would drive people back to smoking. Public Health England has said, responding to US President uh, Donald Trump's plan to axe flavorings due to concerns about use taking up e-cigarettes, PHE said the flavors helped smokers quit switch from more dangerous tobacco. PHE has come under fire from some academics over its stance on e-cigarettes, with some saying it willfully ignores evidence that vaping is harmful. And we saw that all over the place. A lot of that was coming from Bloomberg. Um, Martin Dockrell, head of tobacco control at PHE, said it plans to publish a comprehensive evidence review on the safety of e-cigarettes early next year. So that's this update that we're talking about today, which we're going to get into more details here very shortly. And then uh, in a statement uh, to PA News Agency, Dockrell said e-cigarette flavors are an important advantage that vapes have over smoking and play an important part in encouraging smokers to switch. And then bang, 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 PHE is just right there within hours uh, taking the stand. And uh, how did that go? <laughs> because uh, it got worse, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that... Um... I mean, I get very annoyed when it says they're willfully ignoring the evidence, when they're commissioning all these evidence reviews from those of us. I mean, I'm not employed by PHE. Professor Anne McNeil, who leads the reviews as an independent researcher, is just crazy. What I would say about the flavors is, so in the report that we're talking about today, it's very clear, you know, fruit and sweet flavors are the most popular in the UK, not tobacco. Um, they're clearly important for, for smokers who are, are, are quitting. They separate the act of smoking from vaping. But I'm a researcher and we, we, you know, we always want to do even more research to give people good information. So I think it's likely we'll do a trial of flavored versus unflavored vaping just to put this thing to bed, um, you know, in the near future. So PHG is, is frequently criticized, but, you know, at the end of the day, to say that they're willfully ignoring the evidence is just nonsense because they're not. Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, let's jump to, um, let's jump to, uh, trying to decide here where to start, whether or not we're going to start, uh, right in. Let's do, um, best way I think to get into this will be, uh, the public health matters, uh, that blog that was out. So God bless public health England, right? With the blog and everything. So <laughs> eight things to know about e-cigarettes. This was, and John Newton explained to everybody who John Newton is. Yeah, just hang on a second. Sorry. Sure. You bet. No problem. Well, while, while that's happening. So uh, no, I'm back. I'm just, uh, was, I'm, so I'm in, as you know, Brent, I'm in a hotel room because of meeting and I turned the heating on and it's got so hot in here because I was cold before that. I'm now boiling. So John Newton is the um, director at Public Health England, not of the overall organization, but he's responsible for for science um, at the at the agency. Um, and, you know, his leadership in terms of supporting not only the evidence reviews, but PhDs. Uh, work on a whole variety of topics, including the fact they're dealing now with uh, corona, uh, coronavirus has, has been has been excellent. No, and it has certainly it has. And so let's uh, so let's dive into some of the meat uh, uh, of the reports. I know you've got a lot of things that you want to talk about with regard to the findings. Um, and then I'll de I'll detour us as we go in my wonderful little way. So I'll just bring, we're, we're going to use this as uh, the guideline. So, you know, first off, vaping is not risk-free, but is far less harmful than smoking. Our advice remains that people who smoke are better to switch completely to vaping. But if you have never been a smoker, don't start to vape. And um, so number one issue uh, dealing out of this report is e-cigarettes in the U.S. lung injury outbreak. We've been talking about that. 
Um, now, you guys went, there was something that happened with Lancet. Uh, so let's talk about that for, for a, a real quick second. And then, and also too, I'd like you to react to this because this, this clearly shows that it's a one-off issue that was happening here. There's no long-term problem. There, you know, this is just a, over a, a short couple of weeks. Well, a couple of months, I guess. But. Yeah, it's a number of months. Yeah, I mean, it's an outbreak. It's a public health issue. It's an outbreak caused by, you know, a particular contaminant, which they've now got to the bottom of. In our report, we talk about the yellow card system that the UK has in place through the Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Agency, where we're, let, we're able to monitor what's happening with adverse reactions. And, you know, there have been adverse reactions to e-cigarettes, but nowhere near as many as there have been, for example, I'm just looking at the figures compared to deaths or adverse reactions from nicotine replacement therapy or varenicline. The numbers are tiny in comparison. Um, and we have had a couple of fatalities. I mean, um, four in total, actually. But it's not we're not able to identify that those deaths, unfortunate deaths, uh, were directly linked to vaping. And the MHRA is very open about this. So we continue to monitor. But basically, you had a contaminant. You had a particular product, THC, um, that was being used wasn't designed to be to be vaped um, and you had manufacturers who were um, using a solvent essentially cutting the thc with something that was causing harm um, and we've also said that vitamins are not you know they're not legal in in vaping products in europe which is true but um it's not to say that we wouldn't have the same problem but we didn't and and you know they've now identified the cause but the problem is the media attention and the communication around it totally conflated nicotine vaping with THC vaping that had vitamin E acetate in it. And, and that was, you know, very misleading and very unfortunate. So the blog tries to deal with that. Right, right. And the yellow card system seems to be working. I mean, it, it's in, an actual proof positive that you can have a reporting system. It is. And I think the important thing, uh, you know, all these systems, none of them are perfect, but it can be used by the public as well as by health professionals. Um, and in fact, manufacturers all, all are also required to report. So it gives us um, a single source that we can track through time and look at what's happening with these products and how people are responding to them, particularly importantly in the future, because, of course, the technology is developing all the time. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I know that a lot of people are concerned about is that there has been a stall in technology development. I mean, you can't you can't can't put that aside, right? Like whether it's the you know PMTA process in the U.S., you know, stalling, whether or not it's just you know forty percent destruction of you know the industry to the extent of consumer uh, buying products, right? So that's my fear. And you know, the other thing too, as well, and this is a point I was trying to bring up uh, in in artfully before, was that. Early on, when we kind of onboarded our file here, and you guys had done a good job doing that, almost every single thing that Clive Bates and John Britton specifically uh, mentioned with regard to nicotine strength, getting it, you know, in through the blood system and up to the brain, that's got to get done faster. This was pre-Nixalt, right? And so there was discussions about what needed to happen in technology in order to better mimic uh, uh, the experience of smoking for an adult smoker. Everything was about adults. I mean, yeah, there was the kids, you know, you know, throw under the bus, but we were still talking about adult smokers and so much of the technology development was for adults. And then all of a sudden it's just the, 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 ant, you know, the anti-vaping opponents have taken all of those developments and said those were done specifically to hook kids and they weren't. No, and in fact, the, the latest paper out on, on Juul specifically shows that the 59 milligram per milliliter product um, and the nicotine salts, as you say, the arterial spike and the nicotine delivery is, is basically the same or very close to smoking. And, you know, that's what we wanted to see um, for groups, as we talk about in this report, for example, mental health patients who have rates of smoking if you, if, uh, with diagnosed mental health conditions of 40 percent compared to 15 percent in the uh, general adult population in the UK, heavily dependent smokers. We want good products that deliver nicotine effectively just in the same way as we would prescribe a combination of nicotine replacement therapy, but a, a, more, a more appealing, easier to use product. Um, but yeah, that now the narrative is around the fact that manufacturers have been trying to make them appealing to children and to make them addictive. And that is not I'm not saying there's not any in, irresponsible practice, but, you know, that's that's not what the science is about from my perspective. Yeah, I totally agree for sure. 
So let's jump to the next thing, which is vaping and heart disease. A controversial study that reported that vapors had the same risk of heart disease as smokers was recently withdrawn by the journal. So this is the uh, Journal of American Heart. American Heart. Is that what it is? Journal of the American Heart Association. Yeah. Yeah, right, the correct. one that's um, yeah the 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 study from University of Cali California um, are, uh, yeah are you going to say his name <laughs> from Professor Glantz and <laughs> I think there's a, there was an, a co-author on that paper as well who I, I don't know I have to admit sure so what what are your guys' thoughts on this I mean obviously it, you know it played a big role it fueled the national panic and certainly it was just egregious. So there's a lot of bad science that has happened. There's people in the field who don't really understand the principles of epidemiology, um, who, uh, you know, with lots of study designs, you, there's so many confounders and so many different ways to um, interpret the data that you can come up with almost anything. But I think this study was effectively, you know, important information was hidden and was selected by the authors, and that is not acceptable. And so it's fantastic that the journal retracted it, as as you know, on, on the back of Professor Rodu's um, efforts and others. But this needs to happen much more quickly, and that's not the only study. There's other studies from that team and others, which I think have played an important role in the fear and the misperceptions around vaping. And we need to look at those studies and if possible, they need to be withdrawn as well. So what the PHE blog says is that in contrast to the panic about heart disease and vaping caused by that particular article, we have a new study, the Vesuvius study done in the UK that shows that in the short term, in terms of vascular health, um, smokers who switch to vaping benefit significantly. But you know, has that study got much coverage in the press outside of the UK? No. So it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. The, the good, the good news does not get out. There's no doubt. No, I mean, to be fair, the media is always interested in the bad news story. I mean, look at their panic and, you know, what they're doing at the moment in relation to the, the current virus. Yes. They're not interested um, in that. And they're also not interested in, smoking you know people dying from smoking they don't seem to care about that but it's not um it's not helped by the fact that the scientific community appears divided and that regulators and policymakers around the world are influenced by poor studies and a particular slant on the evidence um, and they use that to make decisions which at the end of the day are not evidence-based so, yeah, I mean, you're very familiar obviously with the long-term battle against uh, big tobacco that's happened and regaled with the hero stories from Glantz and the rest of them from the tobacco papers in the 1990s and so forth, right? So for the longest time, everybody thought you were fighting a real big battle with a big bad guy, and that was big tobacco. Now they put that on vaping, and they've said that vaping is exactly the same thing, you know, operating in the same way. But it's amazing because, you know, anti-tobacco now seems to be using the exact same tactics that big tobacco, they accuse big tobacco of, lying, misleading, conflating, and so forth right? Are, are they not actually mirroring uh, the, the very thing that they were attacking Big Tobacco of for all those decades? But I think that's just incredibly unsophisticated. I mean, you know, it's, it is the case that there are tobacco companies active in this market, um, and that, that there's lots of reasons not to always trust their tactics. But it's much more complicated than that. There's loads of independent companies. The science is fundamentally different. Um, it's not the same. And I, I I find it very frustrating if people, if particularly, you know, regulators who have evidence, access to the evidence and academics who are doing the research to make it that simple, because it ain't that simple. <laughs> this is not the same thing all over again. It's different. I'm not saying that, um, you know, there aren't commercial interests that uh, have their profits as the priority, but it's not the same. So, so Professor Ball, what would you say to officials at Health Canada, FDA, CDC, you know, any one of the number of regulators that seem predisposed right now to be, you know, not so pro vaping? What would you say to them with regard to how to handle the deluge of uh, parents and parent groups and body part orgs, cancer, heart, lung, you know, all over them saying we have to protect the children. We have to protect the children. You know, what kind of advice could you give them with regard to how to handle that? 
Well, I'm a member of the Health, of Health Canada's advisory board, as you know, um, and uh, I also speak to colleagues in the U.S. and other countries. So my um, my role as a researcher is to communicate the evidence, but also to try and encourage countries to have a to take a balanced approach and to recognize that, as you rightly said at the beginning, if if tobacco end game is the goal, getting to five percent or or lower. Um, in the future for Canada and other countries, then what we need to do is support adults to move away from using particularly combustible tobacco. And for people to lose sight of that, including governments around the world, uh, which they have, they have. <laughs> um, so my, my advice to those colleagues is always um, to try and take that into account. But you know, what I see in the Canadian context, just speaking it from a personal perspective here, is that the provinces in particular, where maybe the access to science is not as strong, where the lobby groups and the public opinion is, is very vociferous, have rapidly taken action. And the federal government has been trying to catch up with, with, uh, you know, uh, with real challenges there. So I think it's, it's difficult. And to be frank, the US situation, from my understanding of it, is that uh, you know, they've just not got the regulatory uh, framework set up at all in the way that it should be. Um, and, and that's ca caused huge problems. Doesn't mean that the UK or Europe has got it right because we have weaknesses as well. Um, but I think that uh, balancing those two issues, protecting youth plus supporting adult smokers is the approach that all countries should take and they're not. Yeah, it seems that the balance between the two is gone. It's just protect the youth at all costs. Mm -hmm. And also the other element that I see, and again, this is a personal view is that the young people who are vaping, I mean, there are many young people from disadvantaged communities who are vaping, which from my perspective, if they're doing that instead of smoking is a good thing. But we are seeing vaping amongst affluent teenagers as, a, as something to try. And of course, you then have um, articulate, well-resourced, obviously, as you say, parent groups and others who are very worried that it's their own children who are using something that could be addictive um, or whatever. And... Um, you know, uh, we just forget the groups, people with mental health conditions, including young people, people who are homeless, people who are in the criminal justice system. Um, in our report, we talk about pregnant women who are smoking. You know, what about all those groups? They're just as important, if not more important, than than the affluent teenagers who are trying vaping. And I, str I do struggle with that. Yeah, it, it seems to me that uh, there's no part of being a smoker that fits with inside the oppression ideology that dominates, you know, narrative creation in our media, in our schools, within our businesses, our workplaces, in government, everything else. The smoker is funny because the way they tell the story, smokers are the victims of big tobacco. In fact, almost every single smoker, you talk to any vapor, you know, they're going to have that in their head. They, they were a victim of big tobacco. That's what government told them. That's what public health told them. It was proven that big tobacco was the enemy and you're a victim of big tobacco. You find this solution, now like nobody's a victim. It's like in, in terms of the oppressor Olympics, you know, tobacco smokers uh, are left out. And so you can't fit into the social justice narrative then. And you, you know, so they don't care. Yeah, and there's a huge stigma attached to smoking. Smokers have been stigmatized uh, for decades whether it's about the victimization or the source of it or whatever. And I think we're stigmatized. And, you know, the narrative still is that smoking is an adult choice. Um, and that is people's own. We'd see, actually, to be frank, you see that with overweight and obesity and other topics that I work on as well. You know, the people have done it to themselves and therefore they are not worthy of access to products or help, et cetera. Whereas with children and young people, you know, that's not the same. I just would say one other thing, Professor Dave Hammond's work did show in one paper, of course, that smoking rates amongst teenagers in Canada looked like they were going up slightly. And obviously that's concerning. And I think that's driven some of the, the narrative in Canada, but whether those data will be borne out by the study which continues that he's doing, I don't know, we shall see. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the new part, but the one that RegWatch got a hold of last year uh, and we published it before it had been published, it had said that there was a 45% increase in smoking amongst teens year over year. And I just don't understand how a researcher could release that uh, data point in this environment because it, I mean, it's saturated the news and it's never going away. CBC still says it. 
Yeah, I mean, they, their group, this is the International Tobacco Control Sur Survey, and they have a youth element in 16 to 19 year olds in the US, Canada and the UK. They've produced two papers on it now. Um, and what I would say, and I'm sure Dave, if he was on the program himself, would say that, you know, you need multiple data points through time to actually see what the real picture is. And that's why I say it's important that the work is ongoing and we shouldn't make policy on the back of a single paper. Right. And, you know, let me point out, too, I mean, obviously we've been, uh, you know, hard on uh, David Hammond with this particular report. But, you know, we've asked him to be on the show and we'd love to have him back on the show, have him on the show and can promise him it'd be a very uh, balanced interview um, because, you know, there's not enough conversation going on. If there's one thing that we hear all the time is that one side of public health is not talking to the other side of public health. We've heard that from David Sweener. We've heard that from Brad Rodu. We've heard that from uh, Dr. Farsalinos. I mean, just go on and on and on and on and on. And, you know, heart, lung, cancer, they won't sit down with anybody. Nobody wants to talk to figure this out if you're on the other side. And I think that's maybe where, I mean, to be fair, I, I do see talking more maybe than the examples you've mentioned, including in the Canadian context. But I think this may be also another place where the UK differs. So we have got um, the Heart Association, the cancer, big cancer charity, our big lung charities um, with government, with the key research groups, et cetera, all in the same room. And that's why we have had our consensus statements about vaping is significantly less harmful. So I absolutely agree, dialogue has to take place. And if you can try and do that enough, then you could hopefully reach consensus. But yeah, the developments in the last year uh, in the US in particular, I think have made that challenging. Right. And when you mentioned Health Canada previously, because you and you, I know you can't talk you know, too much about actual confidential conversations. We were very close uh, with getting uh, the health claims cleared right before this happened. And then that just went away. It was just like, you know, kryptonite. You know, what can we expect around that? Do you know? I mean, or, or at least, can, you know, if you've got anything to message <laughs> with around that, because it certainly seems that now more than ever, we need those health claims. So you've spoken to James Van Loon, who is, you know, a very senior civil servant from Health Canada um, about that process. And what I would say is the minutes of that group are available. They're online. Uh, we continue to meet. We're meeting again this spring. My understanding is that those less harmful uh, messages, which would, would have been unique in the world, have not been parked. It's just that um, the issues to do with youth vaping in Canada have overwhelmed attention. And that's that's been the direction of, of travel um, that the federal government and others have had to deal with in the, in the recent uh, in the recent times. But I really hope we can shift some of the emphasis back again. Yeah. And how do you do that? I guess that's where I'm looking for today a little bit is some advice to the people, you know, that are having to deal with the hysteria, you know, the regulators, because, you know, there are good regulators out there. You know, we're, we're not anti-regulation, of course. And so. You know, there's an onslaught that's coming on, on the Save the Children side. Is there an argument that that can be used to help bolster against that? Well, actually, the best thing we can do is, is, is implement things that are going to keep the youth rates low. I mean, at the end of the day, so if you look at our report, which, you know, we're talking about today, the rates of regular vaping amongst uh, teenagers in the UK who've never smoked are tiny. They're less than 1%. Um, actually, the rates of regular use amongst teenagers in Canada and the U.S. who've never smoked are also low, uh, but that kind of gets hidden in some of the studies. So you need to have policies that protect young people, dealing with the marketing, for example, or some aspects of the marketing um, is important. Age of sale, you know, verification and enforcement through trading standards. And if we, if I guess if the public and regulators can see that that's happening and put it in place adequately, then that gives space for some of the things that we're talking about, like less harmful risk messaging, uh, making adequate availability for adults, not taxing the products, which, you know, is being talked about a lot and has happened in some jurisdictions, so that they're just as expensive as smoking, which is insane. It maybe allows space for those. So regulate appropriately to protect youth, but also provide access for adult smokers and for people who are, you know, uh, continuing to vape uh, so that they don't go back to smoking. Very good. Thank you very much for that. That was outstanding. And that will be a short uh, whole truth soundbite at some point here that we're going to release. Let's take a look at this from your report uh, too, as well from the PHE report. This is the 
harm perceptions of vaping compared to smoking in England from 2016 to 2019. What do we see here? It's not good. So bearing in mind that we've tried to, um, you know, stay the course, keep communicating the messages about all the science says these uh, products, uh, regulated nicotine containing vaping products are less harmful than smoking. So what you can see here essentially is that the proportion of people who believe that they are more harmful than smoking is not is a small number, but about the same has gone up significantly and the less harmful has gone down through time. Um, so. Yeah, effectively, we have over a third of smokers in the UK have never tried vaping. And the main reason most of them never try vaping is because they think it's as bad as smoking. Um, yeah, and, and, the, and the numbers are actually even worse, I believe, in Canada and the US. They are. In fact, the data from the US is, is very concerning in terms of risk perceptions. So at the end of the day, the public does not have adequate or accurate information about these products. Now, do you think part of the difference, I would assume the answer would be yes, is the fact that in England, PHC is active in market uh, uh, promoting to the, well, I would say promoting uh, vaping as a, as a tool for harm reduction. And of course, there's bus shelter ads. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different advertising that are making claims. It's time to switch, blah, 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 right? These, these are important things. Does that play that difference, Elise, in bolstering those numbers? Yes, I mean, the harm perceptions are not good, as you can see from that survey, but you're absolutely right, they're not as bad as they are in the US. So the things that are definitely contributing to that are the fact that, yes, we have national policy bodies who are able to say that smokers should try vaping and they should switch to vaping and it's significantly less harmful. And we've, uh, we've used that in our mass media campaigns for uh, smoking cessation. We also have um, doctors who are encouraged to talk to their patients uh, about vaping. And I train general practitioners myself on this topic and other issues related to cancer prevention. Uh, we have stop smoking services who've been giving them out for free. We have hospitals that have opened, that have allowed vaping manufacturers to open shops on their premises. And we have something like, I put down the figure, I can't remember where it is from the report. We have 91% of mental health trusts that allow vaping. Wow. Now you're not seeing that in other places. So you have um, a framework that encourages the use of these products, while also all the other stuff is in place, which is intended to protect youth. So I think unless clinicians, you know, they're not a medicine, but unless clinicians can talk to patients about this in the way that they would other health related issues and products, which are not all about medicines. And unless we can communicate to the public through campaigns or information in a variety of forms, then it's not surprising that people don't understand that they're less harmful than smoking and they should give it a go. You know, a lot of people uh, are of the mind that, hey, look, you know, smoking is going down. It's been going down for decades. It's almost over. Why all this hassle over vaping? Like it's just gotten out of control. And then you look at it, it's disgusting, big clouds. And obviously the kids are getting into it and that is, you know, we can't have that. So, you know, why make all this big fuss over this? Like, why don't we just, you know, shove it back into head shops and stuff like that and just clamp down? So I would say that's quite an arrogant, high income country kind of perspective. They should. I'd like, you know, it'd be great if some of those people who say that could come to some of the countries that we work in where tobacco, combustible tobacco in a whole variety of forms is killing people, it's hugely unregulated, there's no policy framework. So it's not correct to say that smoking is a done deal. It's not a done deal by any measure globally. And even in countries like Canada and the US, the rates are still far too high. So I just think that we are, we have, it's... It's not in proportion with what the risks to health are. Um, and yeah, I think that that's probably part of the explanation. But as I say, I remain hopeful and we'll continue to do our work. Well, hopeful is definitely good. Now, um, I want to talk this for some people. It might be a little bit in the weeds, but I'd like you to just spend a little bit of time nailing down why it's so important. Uh, vaping and mental health and what you found out about pregnancy. Sure. So in this report, we did two new systematic reviews, one on mental health and one on pregnancy. We found relatively few studies, but it's still really important. So just on mental health to emphasize, as I say, 
In the UK, it would be the same in Canada and the US. Smoking rates are far higher in people with diagnosed mental health conditions. They lose on average 10 to 20 years of life in terms of life expectancy. And smoking is a major cause of that. It's not the mental health condition that often, often results in that. Um, so what we found in the report is actually rates of vaping in people with mental health conditions, although there aren't many studies, is higher than in the general population, which is a good thing if it's moving away from tobacco. But we found a lack of information about what um, individuals, clinicians and services should do in relation to supporting people with mental health conditions to switch to vaping. So we've set up a new group in the UK, which Professor Anne McNeil chairs the Mental Health and Smoking Partnership. You might be able to make the link available. There's a very practical guide for health professionals and others working with people with mental health conditions, which basically says, you know, encourage people to switch to vaping and also make it more um, available and um, accepted in uh, mental health services. And secondly, on pregnancy, you know, rates of smoking in pregnancy have gone down in many countries, but it's still the leading preventable cause of neonatal and maternal death and, and a whole variety of conditions. Again, very few studies, but we did find that there's some evidence that pregnant women who smoke are switching to vaping. And we have practical guidance in the UK through the Smoking and Pregnancy Challenge Group, which suggests and encourages midwives and others not to deter pregnant women from uh, vaping when they're pregnant if they're struggling to stop smoking. Um, so that advice exists. And importantly on pregnancy, we've just finished recruiting a very large randomized control trial where pregnant women were randomized to uh, have access to vaping. Um, and support or NRT and support and that the results of that should be available sometime next year. And I hope that that will deal with what I see as a dominant narrative internationally, which is that pregnant women who smoke shouldn't go anywhere near vaping products. And you know what happens when people say that and you're a pregnant smoker who's, you know, trying to quit. Everybody's telling you to quit in your mind. If somebody says, well, you shouldn't try vaping. We don't know about it. It's terribly harmful the mind says, well, I'll just continue smoking then because we know the risks of that and right. we know what the outcomes there are. So the report talks about all these things and I hope it's useful if people are interested in those two topics. And just to say my colleagues um, at King's College particularly led the work on mental health. We are so correct uh, with regard to uh, the impact that the overall uh, narrative that vaping is harmful does, right? Because it certainly if I was pregnant, which of course I can now be because of our new intersectionality rules. Uh, don't get me started. By the way, everybody, uh, Facebook just banned our advertising account uh, today. Knocked out, gone over our last little bit of content released last week. So they're still on us. Uh, I don't think this was vaping this time. I think it was our, uh, our stuff on the uh, climate change and everything else. But either way, there is no voice. I mean, Science, where is the science settled, Linda? Because the fact of the matter is the same people that scream that the science is settled on climate change are the ones that are screaming the science is not settled on vaping. Yeah, I mean, these are, don't, I'm not going to discuss climate change because I know nothing about that and it's not my area of expertise at, at, at all. But um, yeah, in these controversial topics, you pick a topic, it doesn't matter whether it's climate change, gambling, I mean, cannabis has been a huge issue in Canada, etc. If there's any uncertainty around the science, then there are different groups and interests that are going to seize that. And I think vaping is a really, yeah, we've seen some terrible practice and we've seen some terrible misinterpretation of data and evidence. So I'm going to play now a short clip of said terrible evidence. Let's make sure this uh, happens here for us that contract coronavirus. It is people who have pre-existing serious conditions and are over the age of 50. And those pre-existing conditions, and our team has really been working to get this definition clear for everyone because we think it's helpful if it's very, very clear. Heart disease, lung disease, cancer, compromised immune system and diabetes, those five pre-existing conditions. And then one other thing we could call a factor, it's not a pre-existing condition, but it is a factor that we are concerned about and we've seen already. If you are a smoker or a vapor, that does make you more vulnerable. 
and we'll say it probably several times today and in the days to come. If you are a smoker or a vapor, this is a very good time to stop that habit, and we will help you. So, Mayor de Blasio, New York Mayor de Blasio. Coronavirus. If you're a vapor, you're in danger. Yeah, but he has no evidence of any kind to support that. I mean, I've been following this with interest because my colleagues in the College of Medicine are infectious disease specialists, and they're doing a lot of media work on, on coronavirus. So there is good evidence that if people are smoking, they're more prone to respiratory conditions, etc. So he's right there. They will potentially be at greater risk, particularly if they have a you know smoking related condition or a longstanding chronic health condition. But there's no evidence. I've not seen any evidence to suggest, for example, somebody who quit smoking through vaping some time ago, who's improving their health, is going to be at higher risk of coronavirus. So we're seeing statements, not only on this topic, but others as well, that have no basis in fact. But presumably the reason he feels he can say that is because his advisors, I guess this is New York, isn't it? Is it New yes. York? Yes. Yeah, well, we know what's happened with vaping in New York. It's one of the areas where, you know, there's been very restrictive regulation. So I imagine the narrative is very negative and the science that's being used is very negative. Um, it doesn't surprise me, but yeah, it's just very, very unfortunate. Uh, and irresponsible. Yes, uh, that is irresponsible, yes. Yeah, there's not much more we can say without, I mean, you know, my pre blood pl pressure goes up on this topic. It's just... It's just a never-ending uh, series of blows like this. But you, for me, it's a blow to science and common sense, you know. And, and clearly, it seems so ideological. I know you can't comment on that. It just seems so ideological. So as we're coming through, I, we're going to end uh, uh, our, our conversation today a bit on flavors because that's just so important for us to spend some more time on. Before we do that, though, I do want to kind of touch on Maybe it's ideology. I don't, I don't think it is. When we first had you in uh, back in 2016, you talked about a continental divide uh, within public health uh, that had happened. Because really, amazingly, that, you know, if, if, if the bridge, if there was a bridge built within public health, that would fix things. I mean, it seems to be that that's really where the problem lies and where the fix could be. And um, I wanted to talk about that. I'm just going to play a clip again from um, our conversation in 2016. And then I want us to talk about that. In the context of the battle against smoking, with the same organizations now in their battle against vaping, yeah. can you please describe uh, to our viewers the term swarm effect? Well, the swarm effect is where you have like a swarm of bees, many people coalescing on the same issue, um, trying to attack um, whatever they see as a threat. And this is what public health was trained to do against smoking. And they do, and we, yes, absolutely. Uh, in terms of tackling smoking, uh, huge progress has been made. And yes, I am concerned that we are treating e-cigarettes like tobacco, uh, including my public health colleagues in, in a number of countries, and e-cigarettes are, are not tobacco. We need a different frame. E-cigarettes, for me, are about tobacco harm reduction. The Royal College of Physicians report is about tobacco harm reduction. It's a new frame. Uh, I know it's difficult for people to accept. We've never really done harm reduction in tobacco control, so that probably explains some of the resistance, but we need to do it now. So uh, two parts to this. Let's start uh, first with tobacco harm reduction, and then let's we'll move to the swarm. So the tobacco harm reduction, you were saying back then, that's pretty new. Well, has there been better uptake? I know I'm asking a question. I know the answer to. So, but you know, tobacco harm reduction. There was some hope four years ago that that might be the thing that you know really propelled uh, this forward. N nobody's talking about that now. No, I mean we still are. <laughs> <laughs> We are in the UK. New Zealand is, you know, let's not forget. Um, I'm still hopeful in relation to Canada. Um, there, there are people still talking about tobacco harm reduction. And actually, you know, I think we're more, so our colleagues who do harm reduction research in drug, uh, drug studies or sexual health or whatever, you know, we're more at the table with them. So, uh, but I, I, I don't think people get that. There's still a misunderstanding around that yeah, that was your first point what was your second point okay so uh, which was the question i asked you about the swarm which surprised you then and then surprised you again now i was watching you there off off camera um 
Now, for our audience to understand this, that was a, a particular tactic and technique that I pulled out a deep out of some uh, tobacco control manuals, you know, some uh, some exercises and stuff. So it's a thing. And I was asking you about it. So, you know, tell us about the sore effect. And you're like, boom, right there. It's a thing. So what was that thing? Tobacco control invented this swarm effect, or at least perfected part of it. Yes. Yeah, so um, the swarm definitely continues against vaping and um, the selective use of science. Now, you know, there are definitely risks associated with this. Nobody's saying it's completely safe. There are very few things that are. But I think particularly in the U.S., there's been a whole co uh, coalescence in relation to emphasizing the negative aspects, the youth figures going up, um, the lung death and the cases as we've described. So there's definitely a swarming. There are many, many um, vested interests, including some many or some with large pockets who would like to see these products completely banned the way they are in some countries. Um, that is certainly a thing. Just to be a little bit more positive though, I would say that in the US and Canada, when you asked me about the continental divide, there are some excellent scientists doing research on tobacco harm reduction in Canada, in the US, etc., that we have a lot of contact with. And in fact, for next time's Public Health England report for the big one to inform the UK regulatory framework in the context of Europe, we're bringing on co-authors from the US, some of the best scientists, to look globally at what the data tells us. And I think that kind of working together is very important. Yeah, and it's important, uh, I think, to call out. Now, there's probably some others that you you can mention, but the group at um, NYU, School of Global Public Health, they've really just in the last couple of years just come out swinging. So Professor David Abrams, uh, Professor Ray Nayura, who used to be at the Schre uh, Schroeder Institute within Truth. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're top, top um, colleagues are fantastic. Professor Neil Benowitz at the University of California, Maciek Gonowicz. There's others who are, you know, there's there's wonderful scientists um, across the U.S. and in Canada as well. Uh, and so, yeah, we working with them, I think we can get a, a, a more global picture. Whether we will be listened to in terms of how the regulatory framework is developing is another question because we can't control that. Our job is to do the science and to try and get that across. Now, one of the things that happened soon after the vaping-related lung illness scandal hit the airwaves and everything else was a concerted effort by many in the media, partnered with the groups, um, to go out and try to discredit the foundational science that supports vaping. Bloomberg had a 5,000-word article towards the end of September, so right at the height of it, that went after RCP, went after PHE, went after... Uh, Dr. Rodu went after Dr. Peloso, went after Dr. Farsalinos, attacking the foundational science, saying you got it wrong. Now, has that continued? Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming you saw, you noticed it. Has that continued that attack? Um, and either way, what kind of impact did that attack have? Well, just speaking about RCP and PHE, because obviously I can't speak for the others. Um, Yes, so PhD is still criticized regularly around the reports that have been produced, particularly the 95% figure, which has a whole story behind it. But uh, the RCP report um, came up with a very similar figure, looking in a more systematic way at the evidence. Um, and there are colleagues in a number of countries who say that um, PhD, there's even an article saying that public health industry has been captured by tobacco industry interests. But, you know, there was recently a global index published um, by the researchers who are looking at that globally to identify which countries have managed in their policy frameworks to avoid uh, tobacco industry having direct influence over policy. And the UK was, if not the top, very close to the top. Um, and that includes PhD, which has very clear rules. You've interviewed Martin Dockel yourself. Um, so I just completely, I find that offensive uh, because I work with those organizations um, and, you know, they're not in the pocket of, of, of tobacco companies. It's total crap. On that note, uh, we're just going to jump over here to uh, our support.regulatorwatch.com website. Regulatorwatch.com, of course, is industry funded and fan funded, and nobody tells us how to cover the topics that we do. We have 100% editorial control. We don't buy into this whole garbage that where the funding comes from, that that's going to make a difference in terms of the content. 
Uh, and we're very happy, in fact, actually, that our supporters do what they do, and we need more like them. So if you get a chance, please go to support.regulatorwatch.com. Take a look around. I've got some updates to do here, but now more than ever, we really do need your help uh, to come in. So a couple bucks here and there makes a huge difference. If you're an American, we love those American dollars. Just shoot them our way. More on that right towards the end of the show. So, Linda, okay, two more. One out of the blue. How much of a problem is the World Health Organization? Um, so that's a bit more difficult for me because I work with WHO on other topics. Um, so uh, what I would say is that they recently produced some materials on uh, the state of the science and the evidence on e-cigarettes. I think it was sort of January time, um, which I, those of us who are doing the research found very unhelpful and in fact inaccurate. Um, they did go back and correct some of that, but I would still say that the content of that is not correct um, in relation to all the different uh, issues they were looking at. So I think that the WHO has taken their precautionary principle to um, a very significant extent. And as a result, um, there are a number of countries that are, have, I think, their regulatory decisions to ban the products completely have been influenced by the WHO. Now, I don't think vaping is the answer to smoking in Malawi or um, Ethiopia or countries where the resources are tiny and they don't have infrastructure for much more basic things. Let's be clear about that. But I, d I don't think that the WHO has perhaps shown the um, positive leadership in this area that they should have done. That is the most neutral response I can give you, but it's the appropriate one. That's a great response. It is the response. So that's what makes it uh, perfect. So on flavors, what do what does a parent need to know who's only heard all of the stuff in the media of, about vaping being bad and blaming it on flavors? Because let's uh, before I put the full preface on that, let's make sure that we we fully discuss your report. Uh, the PHE report shows that uh, curiosity is yeah. mostly the reason why. The U.S. Uh, reports out of the CDC, clearly like 55% of respondents of youth say that it's curiosity. And the Canadian numbers are the same, around 30%, 40, you know, 30, 35%. Yeah. So it's clearly, all of a sudden here in the last couple of months, all of the studies are coming out from the regulators, from the health agencies, saying you don't even have flavors on them. It's, you know, it's curiosity. So have we been sold a bill of goods? Um, have we been sold a bill of goods? So definitely our research shows that flavors are not the driver of youth uptake of vaping. And if you talk to teenagers, we do lots of qualitative ones. We have done some qualitative studies with teenagers and my colleagues have done more. And flavors are not, they're interested in flavors, of course, but that's not the main driver. As you say, it's curiosity is to give it a try. And I think that's consistent. Um, so I think that the... Um, the fact that there is a plethora of e-cigarette flavors, of vaping flavors, and also that they have been marketed in particular ways, I think has caused real concern about them. And that's why you're seeing a flavor, ba flavor bans. But I don't think flavors are the problem. Uh, the data doesn't suggest that. And I think they could be very helpful for smoking cessation. So by all means, restrict um, you know, the glamorous, glitzy advertising the celebrity endorsement, et cetera. I don't think you need that. Adult smokers don't need to see, pick a name of celebrity using the product to encourage them to try it if they've got access, it's available in their local community, it's affordable. But, you know, our study show, our, our latest report shows fruit and sweet flavors, the most popular amongst uh, smokers who switch to vaping. So why should those be taken away if it's part of what makes uh, vaping a good option for them? Um, so I think the issues have been confused and I don't think that flavor bans are going to be the answer to protecting young people. And I think that they will um, have a negative impact on the smoke on the adult smokers who switch to vaping. Do you think the en entire plethora of media coverage may had something to do with, you know, peaking curiosity? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the media has been incredibly unhelpful on most of this full stop. Uh, but but to be fair to journalists, um, you know, many of whom are, are excellent colleagues and try their best with the information they have, it's bloody confusing in terms of what's being released. Yeah. 
It's hard to imagine that it could be such a confusing issue because it seems always to be one where if you just applied common sense to it, it would make sense. Well, yes, I think, I mean, that, yes, that in an ideal world, that would be the case. But um, yeah, that's not that's not where we are. But just back to your question. So I think we need more research on flavors, but I don't think they're the problem. And I, I don't think that flavor bands are going to be helpful, is my personal view. So let's just walk that through. Flavor bands, no taxes. So, there, so um, in our report, again, we talk about the fact that particularly for colleague, for people with mental health conditions, they could save around £700, that's about $800, $850 US a year by switching from smoking to vaping in the UK because we don't tax the products. They just have a, a VAT, a value added tax on them. Um, so my view, if they're going to, if they're helping people stop smoking, then we want them to be more significantly more affordable than tobacco. And of course, it's important that tobacco, that smoking is expensive because we know that does deter people either from taking it up and it can encourage people to quit. So I don't really see the point of taxing vaping products um, because it will deter people from using them. And if we have to increase the cost, it should be relative to smoking and these products should be cheaper than tobacco products, significantly cheaper. Now, what about ubiquity of access? Because we're seeing a lot of access being shut down to these products, whether it's at sea store or grocery, uh, voluntarily, or or the regulatory bodies are doing it. I mean, it, it's been retracted. Uh, some of our some of our U.S. viewers were telling us the other day that they had just, you know, really actually kind of quit uh, smoking with Juul just in the spring of last year, and already now, like they walk into Walgreens and there's this huge chunk of empty shelf where there was like no vaping products, and right beside the smokes, right. So, you know, as somebody who's worked in nicotine and tobacco research for many years, to take these products away from a retail environment and leave tobacco products makes absolutely no sense at all. So we all saw the images, I think it was from the US Army, where they, on the Army supply list, they'd removed all the vaping products, but they left all the tobacco. Yes. It's just insane. So I'm not saying that these products should be sold everywhere. I think. Uh, different um, jurisdictions need to make their own decisions about that. But we certainly shouldn't be not making them available, but allowing tobacco to be continue to be sold. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me. The solution for youth in terms of different retail outlets is, is um, enforcement of age of sale. It's not taking them away completely from that venue with a view to protecting youth when what you're doing is uh, taking them away from, from adults who need, who need to purchase the product. So I don't understand that. We haven't seen that here. So last question for you, Professor Bald. What would the future look like if vaping was abandoned and made illegal? You mean in the UK or just anywhere? UK, US, Canada. The big three Westerns. Uh, well, the genie's out of the bottle. So technology has been developed that is significantly less harmful than smoking from all the evidence we have to date. And smokers are using these products uh, with success. So if you take them out of the market completely, what are the outcomes going to be? Overall, from the modeling that's been done, they're going to be negative for public health. Some smokers will go back to smoking um, and other smokers, including the 37% of them we have in the UK who've never tried vaping, won't have that option. Um, so a few fewer young people might take it up. But as I say, the figures to me are not that concerning in terms of regular vaping or indeed vaping uh, causing smoking in young people, which I don't see evidence, strong evidence that that's the case. So removing these products from the market will, from all the evidence I've seen, have a negative impact on public health overall, not a positive one. And you just mentioned basically the gateway theory. I mean, is there credence to the comment that vaping from youth, when youth vape, they are more likely to start smoking traditional cigarettes? So there are a number of studies that are um, longitudinal studies that show that there are a proportion of kids who try vaping or who are past 30 day vapors who then a year later when you follow them up have tried smoking or are, have become a smoker. But we don't have evidence that those two are directly connected. And for me, and I've said this before, the litmus test is population level youth smoking rates, which are going down in the US, uh, they're going down in the UK. The Canadian data, we wait to see what the full picture is through time. 
but I'm not seeing evidence that can directly link vaping with rises in smoking for young people. Um, that may emerge in the future, but from our work that we do with young people, young people see the two products as very different and really quite separate products. And finally, my last word on this, for some young people who are very much at risk of becoming smokers, you know, they've grown up in a smoking household, tobacco products are widely accessible and cheap in their communities. If they uh, become a vapor instead, then that's a positive, not a negative thing. Well, that's great. Well, Linda, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And I know our viewers do as well. Not at all. And I'm just sorry that I'm in this hot, stuffy hotel room, which is not the ideal um, environment for an interview. But as always, Brent, it was great to speak to you. Thank you for your questions. And thank you very much for your interest in the Public Health England reports and the research that we're doing in the UK. Well, it's great to have you. Just hang tight right there for one second, Linda. And that's it for this edition of RegWatch. Before you head off, please head on over to support.regulatorwatch.com. That's support.regulatorwatch.com and consider making a financial contribution to our vaping coverage. It's easy. Just dig into your wallet and find a few dollars and toss them our way. Do it. <laughs> You'll be happy you did. And so will we. And while online, don't forget to like us on Facebook and to follow us on Twitter. For regulatorwatch.com, I'm Brent Stafford.